Hi everyone, it's so weird recording a thumbnail without holding a stack of books. I'm so used to holding things, having props, and I had no props for that thumbnail, just my face, and I felt like that was awkward. Hi. <laughs> my name is Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer, and I upload videos here every Sunday evening. And last Sunday, I uploaded a video that was about an hour and 40 minutes long, where I read and reviewed all of this year's Booker Prize long-listed books. That took a long time to film, so I thought for this week's video, we could chill out a bit, calm down, and not do something like that, and instead just I would sit down and have a chat with you and we can catch up, because I don't know when I last filmed a video where I just talk to you. I've asked on Instagram if you had any questions. You sent me questions about life and reading and writing and house stuff and favourites. So I'm going to answer those here. I'm also very aware that new people find this channel all the time. Hi if you're new and hi if you're not new. And whilst I do have an introduction video on this channel, I think that's now nearly or over four years old. And there's something weird about recording a lot of your life and having it on the internet and having done that for a long time, it's odd to think that someone now could find a video of mine from nearly 10 years ago, because next year I'll have been uploading on this channel for 10 years, and then maybe not look at the date and, and assume that that's me now. And there's a lot of dissonance there. It just makes me feel a little bit odd. So I thought that if you are new or relatively new, or even if you just like a refresh, you might become more acquainted with me in this video. So if you are new and you haven't seen that introduction video, in summary, my name is Jen, as I said, hi. I am an author, a book reviewer, a disability advocate. I have written 12 books for adults and for children across fiction, non-fiction, poetry, picture books. I've worked in the publishing industry for over 15 years now. Um, I started life as a bookseller and now I work freelance in the industry. I do freelance editing. I also create content on here. I'm a book reviewer for various outlets in print and on the radio. I have judged literary prizes. I do um, writing workshops. I give talks on various topics. I do lots of different things, but all of them relate to books in one way or another. I'm also a queer person and a disabled person. And as I said, I upload bookish videos on this channel. I have a special interest in the history of fairy tales too. So that should give you just some idea of what to expect if you have only seen a couple of my videos before. So I have your questions here that you have sent to me and I thought we could just dive in, grab a snack if you would like to, grab a cup of tea. I've got a glass of water here. I will refrain from grabbing some snacks because I feel like it's not appreciated normally if people eat and talk and film at the same time. So I will spare you. The question that was asked the most, in fact, two questions that were asked the most because you're all very lovely, was how am I and how is Lola? Um, so Lola, if you don't know, is because we have to start with Lola rather than me because priorities. Lola is my mother-in-law's dog and we look after her quite a lot. You'll see her pop up in vlogs. She is a lovely Jack Chi and I think many of you asked because I said in the book of video that she wasn't very well. She's fine. She just likes to eat whatever she can lay her hands on, I was going to say, her paws on. Sometimes that backfires. You know, I don't know what she's eaten, but she's absolutely fine. She is a 14-year-old Jack Chi because I got lots of questions about her breed as well. We did one of those doggy DNA tests several years ago when people were doing those. It was quite fun, to be honest. And that said, she was mostly Chihuahua and Jack Russell, but also had a bit of Yorkshire Terrier and Springer Spaniel in her as well. And yes, as I said, she's 14. So she is an older lady, but there's a lot of life in her yet. And as for how am I, I'm doing okay, thank you. It is sunny outside, but not too hot. And um, it's a Friday and I have some laundry drying outside. So I'm gonna take all of those things as a win. I have not organized these questions into any kind of order. I did think about it, but then I thought it might be fun to just zip zap around between topics. So one of the questions that was asked me was, and we're gonna jump back in time, what was the transition from university life to uh, post uni life like for you? I've just graduated. I graduated in 2009, congratulations on graduating to you. So it has been a while, but when I graduated, it was a bit of a ridiculous time. Let me explain, it was quite funny. It wasn't funny at the time, but looking back on it, I'm okay with it, I've made my peace. I did a degree in English literature, which I'm sure will surprise a total of zero people in Edinburgh. And I also worked as a bookseller while I was doing my degree. 
And when I graduated, I was offered a job as a bookstore manager in Edinburgh, but I turned it down because my partner, who is now my husband, was doing further education, but in London. So I decided to move with him and I got a job working at a bookshop in London instead. However, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I've always wanted to be a writer, but I knew that I would need another job to sustain me while I tried to make it as a writer. So I got a job working as a bookshop, but really I wanted to work in publishing. So I decided that I would do an MA in publishing because I'd been told you needed one of those to get into publishing. You don't. It's just the universities tell you that because they want your money. They do teach you lots of things, but you absolutely don't need that extra degree to get into publishing. So I decided I was going to work for a year, save up and then do the degree part time while still working. However, a month or so after graduating, I was called up to jury service. And at that point, I'd got a job working at the new bookshop, but I was still being trialed. I was due to start full time the week that jury duty started. At that point, I'd been working, I think, for a couple of weeks, two days a week so that they could see if we got on with each other. And when you do jury duty, they only reimburse you for the money you're losing via not working. So I could only claim two days working a week. And that's not enough, but I thought I can probably just make it work because jury duty is only supposed to be two weeks long. They're supposed to tell you if it's gonna be a really long case and they hadn't said it was going to be. So I thought, okay, that's fine. For two weeks, I can manage this. But then my case ended up being over six months long. And I obviously can't talk about it because you're not allowed to talk about these things. I really wish I could though, because I have lots of stories about it. Can't even put it into a book one day because it would be too obvious. But yeah, it was a ridiculous time and stressful because as I said, I was only getting paid two days work a week for doing this over the course of more than six months. Anyway, all of it meant that I didn't end up saving any money at all, L lost so much money and then also couldn't do because of that the um, MA in publishing, which is, you know, in the grand scheme of things is fine. But at the time I just felt, I don't know what I'm doing with my career at all. This had been my plan. And now I'm stuck on this um, not very nice case for over six months. And I don't know what I'm doing when I leave. So when I left, I did go into working full time at that bookshop. And then I ended up working there for many years and it was fine. But Yes, very uncertain, I would say, was my time leaving university. Very chaotic, very ridiculous, and also very secretive and annoyingly secretive because, as I said, I have tales. Next question, the next one I've picked at random. Someone says, what TV shows have you enjoyed recently? And I, this year, have made a list of the TV shows and films that Mr M and I have been watching because I often just immediately forget whatever we have watched. It's like when someone says, what's your favourite book? And you immediately think you've never read anything ever, but you actually have. So I have a list and I have put a little star beside the ones that we have loved the most. So this year, the things that we have loved the most are Happy Valley, which is everyone's favourite, starring Sarah Lancashire. It is a uh, crime and James Norton. It's a crime show where she is a policeman. There are three series of it. And there was a big gap between season two and season three, which came out at the beginning of this year. It's just so well written. The character development is fantastic. And it's so tense, so tense. So we love that. Um, we really enjoyed watching Beef, which again, I think everyone did. Um, it's about road rage and about the sides of ourselves that we show to other people and how things can spiral out of control. We enjoyed watching Siren, which is a Korean show where there were groups of women on an island. There were a group of firefighters, a group of police women, a group of stunt women. I can't remember what the other categories were, but they were basically trying to best each other. It was a lot of fun. We enjoyed watching Silo, which is on Apple TV. I had quite an amusing time watching that because it had been recommended to me and I started watching it. And I thought, this is just a ripoff of Wool by Hugh Howey. And I was getting quite annoyed about it. I haven't read Wool in full. I read the beginning of it years and years and years ago. And to be honest, just thought it was terribly written, but I really loved the premise. Um, and I just thought someone has taken this and they've turned it into this thing and I don't like it. And then when the credits came up at the end of the first episode, it said, you know, based on the book, Wool by Hugh Harry. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I will allow that then. Uh, yeah, it is a dystopian, post-apocalyptic book about a group of people, thousands of people who live in the silo, which is this 
underground place and there's a huge staircase that runs in the middle of it, this huge spiral staircase and you can walk between floors. It's quite hard to explain actually, but no one's allowed to go outside. No one's allowed to go outside. The air is supposedly toxic, but if someone breaks the rules, they might get sent outside. Um, it was quite slow at first, but I really enjoyed the direction that it went in and I'm looking forward to seeing the second series. We also enjoyed Hijack with Idris Elba, which I would not recommend if you're getting on a plane anytime soon. It is a seven part drama set on a plane that has been hijacked. You may have guessed that from the title. Idris Elba is one of the passengers and it's filmed like 24, it's filmed in real time. So seven hours for a seven hour flight and it's him trying to negotiate with the hijackers to stop this plane crashing. Very, very compelling. We also really enjoyed The Lazarus Project, which stars Papa Asiju, who I really adore. And it is a time travel-ish show. It is a version of our world, is our world, but it has a sci-fi element where there is apparently a group of people who work with MI5, they're called The Lazarus Project, and their aim is to stop the world from ending. And every so often, maybe a country will send a nuclear strike to another country and then that leads to global nuclear war and the world ends and when they know the world is going to end they hit a reset button and the world resets to july the first of that year so there's a constant resetting of the world going on it's just only the people who work at the lazarus project are aware of it but occasionally there will be people who become aware of it and then they are hired to work for the Lazarus Project. And that's what happens to Papa Asiju's character. He is hired to work for the Lazarus Project when he starts getting all of this deja vu and realizing that things have happened before. So whilst it is about trying to save the world, it is more about the personal relationships between the people who work at the Lazarus Project and also the people in their lives who are not aware that the world has been resetting, like their partners, for instance. And you could try and reset the world for selfish reasons because you would like to go back in time and fix something in your life. And once you're aware that that's the thing that happens, it can lead you to abuse this power that you have. I thought it was so, 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 so good. Um, I also enjoyed watching Race Across the World. We watched all of the series this year, but it's been going for a few years. We just weren't aware of it. It's on the BBC. It is a reality TV show. The first series is my favorite and it's lots of pairs. I think, it, is it 10 pairs? Maybe it's fewer, I can't remember. But it's pairs of people like mothers and daughters and best friends or couples who sign up to do this challenge of getting from London to Singapore for the price of a flight from London to Singapore, except they have to do it all on foot or by car or by boat. And it follows them as they try and do that. And they can work along the way to try and earn more money if they want, but it's all about budgeting, not getting lost, not falling out with each other too much. And again, we just thought it was brilliant. And I guess the final one I will mention is something that we watched on Netflix called Kaleidoscope, which is a heist drama you can watch the episodes in any order. So Netflix will use, an, I guess, a generator to just show you the episodes in random orders. And depending on what order you see the episodes in, you will get a different view of that particular show. And I thought that was quite a cool concept. Someone said, what are your favorite London bookshops? Um, I love Gay's Word, I love Foils. There are lots of places that I love, London Review Bookshop. I have a book crawl bookshop crawl map that I made ages ago. I'll link it in the description box down below. If you ever find yourself in central London and you wanna do a bookshop crawl, I think there's about 10 bookshops on this list and they're about a five, 10 minute walk between each other. I'll link that map down below. And someone else said, what are your favorite bookshop experiences? I have visited lots of bookshops. I used to write about bookshops. That was the thing that I did at the beginning of my writing career, I wrote a series of books about bookshops. One of those was called The Bookshop Book, which was about 300 amazing bookshops around the world, all about the people who run them and also about the history of books. Now, I didn't get to go to all of those 300 bookshops because publishing doesn't pay you to do that, but I did research them and I did go to a lot of the ones in the UK in particular. One of my favorite bookshop experiences 
was when I was researching for the bookshop book, I went to Wigtown in Scotland, which is Scotland's national book town, like Hay on Wye is Wales' national book town. If you're not aware of book towns, let me enlighten you. Bookshop towns tend to come in existence because the industry of a certain town has been lost and lots of the residents used to work there and now they don't have jobs. That's how many of them have come about. In Wigtown, I think it was the creamery and the brewery and then the train line that was connecting them closed. So one bookshop existed there already, um, which used to be a jeweler's, but then they got robbed and he needed to restock his shop, couldn't afford to buy jewelry and so bought books instead. And that became known as the bookshop, just the bookshop, it's now, arguably the largest secondhand bookshop in Scotland. I think it's, the title is fought over between that and Leakey's in Inverness. Both of them are amazing bookshops. Anyway, then Wigtown applied to be the National Book Town of Scotland and they got permission to become the National Book Town of Scotland. They applied saying people come open a bookshop here and lots of people came and also people who already live there set up bookshops. So just imagine a high street where people have converted their living rooms into bookshops. There was, at that point when I went in 2012, I think there were about 22 bookshops on a high street, all selling different things, mostly secondhand, and it was just the most magical place. Anyway, I went to Wigtown in 2012 because I was doing an event at their book festival for my book, Weird Things Customers Say in Bookshops. I'd written a book about strange stuff that people had said to me as a bookseller. And when I got to Wigtown, I was approached by lots of people in the first half hour saying, oh, hi, Jen, um, welcome. Have you met Sean yet? And I hadn't met Sean. Sean now runs the bookshop, the biggest bookshop in Scotland. And lots of people told me to stay out of his way because he was apparently really angry with me that I had written a book called Weird Things Customers Say in Bookshops because he had wanted to do that too. He just hadn't got round to doing it yet. So I was terrified that I was gonna run into this person who apparently hated me. So I was tiptoeing around, I went to the open party, there was fireworks and I didn't know what Sean looked like so I couldn't even avoid him. And then I did end up running into him and um, I said, I've been told that you hate me. <laughs> and he laughed because he said it's just the kind of place where gossip can get a bit extensive and that was not true. And he said, yes, I, I would like to write a book like that, but I don't know if anyone's told you, Jen, but I am far too grumpy to pull off something like that. Sean is basically real life Bernard Black. He is amazing, I love him, we became friends. He has now written a series of books. The first one is called Diary of a Bookseller and I'm sure that many of you know him. This is a picture of us from 10 years ago when we were little babies. I absolutely adore him and his bookshop is magical. And Wigtown is just full of these amazing stories. When I stayed there, I stayed in a room above a bookshop called Reading Lasses, which is run by a woman called Jerry, who's not just a bookseller, she's also a humanist celebrant. So not only does she sell books, she also marries people on beaches and around Scotland, but also in her bookshop, which is just amazingly cool. Anyway, I wrote about Wigtown and other book towns around the world in the bookshop book if you're interested and would like to check that out, I'll link it down below. But another one of my favorite bookshop experiences was going to Shakespeare & Co in Paris. I'd been a couple of times, but in 2014, I went to give a talk about my book, the bookshop book, because it had just come out at that point, And I got to stay in the bookshop. If you're not familiar with Shakespeare and Company, it is the most amazing bookshop. It is right opposite Notre Dame in Paris. That's not where it was originally, but that's where it is now. It was opened in 1919 by a woman called Sylvia Beach. She was a queer woman, and during the Nazi occupation of Paris in the Second World War, she was forced to close her shop because soldiers came into her um, place of work and were extremely threatening. It was then reopened in her name several decades later by a man called George Whitman, who was American and he named his daughter Sylvia after Sylvia Beach, and now Shakespeare and Company is run by Sylvia. It has this amazing community feel. People travel from all over the world to work in the bookshop, and they can also sleep in the bookshop if they happen to work there. There is a bedroom above the shop that you can stay in if you're an author giving an event, so I got to stay in the bookshop and it was so magical. I filmed a vlog and that was nine years ago. So the video is private now, but I'll insert some footage here so that you can see um, how amazing it was. Um, to be honest, I filmed it on my phone, so it's not great quality footage, but it was the most 
I don't know, warm-hearted, big hug feeling to sleep at that bookshop, which contains so much history and just so much love. It will forever have the most special place in my heart. So that, again, is one of my favorite things. I could waffle for ages about my favourite bookstore experiences, um, but most of them are in the bookshop book, so if you would like to read about them, you can. Actually, someone asked me a question which made me giggle, and I've written it down, where is it? Someone asked me, what is the weirdest place you have ever sold a book? I thought this was interesting, and I was <laughs> trying to think about what that person meant, and maybe if you're the person who asked this, you can leave it in a comment down below because I have traveled on book tour to lots of different places, to weird bookshops where I have sold copies of my books. And maybe one of the most fun places that I did that was on a bookshop called The Book Barge, which is a bookshop on a boat run by a wonderful woman called Sarah Henshaw. She now lives in France, but her bookshop used to be in Litchfield and she had a bookshop bunny called Napoleon Bunny Part. And I have done an event on uh, her boat before. So maybe that's the weirdest place that I have sold a book. But I was thinking about it and actually the weirdest place that I have accidentally sold a book before, like hand sold a book. One of my egg collection operations, because I've been doing IVF now for, for many, many years, one of my egg collection operations fell on World Book Day. And normally on World Book Day, I would be, well, not at the moment, not in uh, the last four years, but prior to that, I'd normally be in schools during World Book Day and giving talks to kids. Um, my favourite was when I went to a school in Annick and I absolutely sobbed because they had changed their library and it was all painted with Franklin and Luna, who were two characters in um, my picture books, which are illustrated by Katie Harnett. I'll insert footage of that here because I still can't get over it years and years later. Anyway, World Book Day is a wonderful thing and I love it so much and I get to talk about books with kids. These days it's remotely um, but on this particular day, I wasn't even doing that because I was in hospital for an egg collection operation and I was in the operating theatre. Kind of odd you walk into the operating theatre when you're having an egg collection operation. I've had over 30 operations in my life and normally they take you into a, a prep room and then once you're asleep, they'll wheel you into the operating theatre. But because you have to put your legs in stirrups and get into undignified positions to do a collection operation, they get you to walk into the operating theatre and lie down on the table and then they put you to sleep. And when they're getting ready to give you the anaesthetic, normally the anaesthetist and the nurse or the doctors will talk to you to kind of calm you down and make you feel relaxed. I don't tend to need that because I don't feel panicked in those situations anymore. I absolutely do not like procedures when I'm gonna be awake, that makes me feel anxious. But if you're giving me a general anesthetic, I am fine. I'm gonna be asleep, I don't mind. But one of the questions that they asked me on that day, on World Book Day was, what do you do for a job? So I said, I'm an author, that's what I do, I write books. And they seemed to be really intrigued by this. And then the anesthetist said, what, what kind of books do you write? And I said, well, I write for adults and I write for kids. I've written picture books. And she said, isn't it World Book Day? Shouldn't you be in schools right now selling books? And I said, well, I, yes, but I have to be here for this operation. And she said, no, that won't do. So she got out her iPhone. I was questioning the hygiene of everyone getting out their iPhones in an operating theater, but I'll let that pass. She got out her iPhone and she said, tell me, what is the name of your book and what age group is it for? So I said, it's for three to seven year olds and it's called Franklin's Flying Bookshop. And she said, oh, my son is five. I'm gonna buy it for him. So she literally bought it in front of me. And then the nurse said, well, I feel really jealous now. I want to buy something. So she went on her phone and she bought Franklin's Flying Bookshop too. And then the doctor who was doing the procedure said, well, 
I have an older child, have you written anything for older children? And I said, yes, I've written a book called The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers. So she then went on her phone and bought the book as well. Can we please, I mean, don't picture it that much, but just imagine I'm lying on a table wearing a hospital gown, but with my feet in spirits, spirits? stirrups in quite a, as I said, not the most dignified position, ready to be put to sleep, you know, got a hairnet on, uh, yeah, and, and I am accidentally selling copies of my book. So these lovely people who were going to do this procedure on me to hopefully help in my IVF journey and they're wanting to support because they feel bad because I am in hospital instead of out in schools or remotely doing events for schools and selling my books. So that is probably the weirdest place I have ever sold a book. <laughs> Someone says, um, I have been inspired to pick up many things because of you. What are some things that you have been influenced to buy because of the internet, but not book related, not book related? Um, I probably heard about Gusto through the internet. I imagine Gusto is a, a subscription, um, like a meal box subscription service. And Mr. M and I have been using it for six years now. We use it every week. We love it. I do have a referral code if you're interested in the description box, which I think gets you about 60% off. But that I probably found through the internet. Wild deodorant, I definitely found through the internet. There was a period where lots of people were being sponsored by them. I have never been sponsored by them or gifted anything, but I thought that, well, I guess the marketing just worked and I went out and I bought some deodorant. It's a natural deodorant and I absolutely love it. I've been using it for maybe three years now and it's my favorite. It's great, I love it. Those are probably two things, at least the two things that spring to mind. I'm sure I've been influenced to pick up other things. Another question someone asked me was, what are a couple of purchases that you have made recently um, that again are not book related? I have a practical one and a real impractical one. So my practical one is this. This is a Sonic scourer and I bought it to clean the grout in the bathroom. This is what life is like in your late 30s. Um, I'm very pleased that I bought this and have used the pink stuff paste. Oh, it was so satisfying to clean that grout, which was disgusting. And then the uh, non-practical purchase is, is this, this is a stuffed opossum, which I bought when I was feeling very down after surgery a couple of months ago. And we call him Toadstool and I don't regret a thing. I don't regret a thing. I really love having him in my life. <laughs> Someone said, how are you enjoying your home, the garden? What changes have you made? Will you make any house purchases? So we moved here early last year and we haven't done much to the house. I have painted some walls. Um, we've tackled the damp problem that we had. This is an Edwardian house, so inevitably there's gonna be some damp. And we thought it was maybe structural, but it turns out that the people who lived here before just hadn't really been taking care of the house and airing it and making sure the moisture didn't build up. So having lived here a while and making sure that we do air the house, that has mostly gone. If you wanna see something gross but also satisfying. One of the tasks that I had tasked myself with was replacing the sealant in our kitchen sink. We have wooden tops in the kitchen, which I love, but around water, it's not so good. It's not so practical. And as I said, this house hadn't been taken care of in the best way possible. So there was a lot of mold on the sealant around the sink, which just thinking about makes me want to throw up a little bit. So I've never removed any sealant and I've never like put a new sealant on. I realize this is not a huge task, but I, I didn't know how to do it. So I was like, I'm gonna learn and I'm gonna do it. And this is what the sealant looked like when I took it off. This is me holding up a strand in front of the wall, okay? Disgusting, but now look, I have resealed it and it is now shiny and new. And every time I look at it, it pleases me. Someone said, as a freelancer, your job must change all the time. What's an overview of the evolution of your job and what does your job look like now? So I started working as a bookseller and I was trying to make it in inverted commas, whatever that means, as a writer. And I was submitting to literary journals and competitions. I was getting published in various places and winning a few things. Then my first book was published in 2012. 
just before that I had thought I still wanted to work in-house for a publisher and I'd gone for some interviews and I'd got to final stage interviews at a few places but I had a really horrible experience with one publishing company who made it very clear to me that the reason that they weren't going to hire me wasn't because I couldn't do the job but was because they were very uncomfortable with my disability with my hands and they therefore weren't going to hire me and that's entirely illegal for them to say but me as a shy person in my early 20s thought oh well that's quite rude but I understand that's fine completely internalized it and then thought okay I don't think working in-house for a publisher is for me I'm going to continue working as a bookseller doing writing and then soon after that my first book was published and then I went on to publish a book a year like well pretty much ever since I've published a book a year and that was fine now I work freelance for publishers anyway and it ended up working out best for me because I write books but also my disability has changed so much over the years that I really now recognize that an in-house nine to five job would not be feasible for me i.e one sitting at a computer and typing all day it wouldn't work for my arthritis it wouldn't work for my eyesight and I have I hate this word curated a job for myself that really works I work really hard but I have flexibility in all the different things that I do some of it is writing and typing some of the times I'll do voice to text when I'm doing that sometimes I am filming videos sometimes I am, am reading books and giving feedback and doing editorial all of those allow movement and I make sure that I can change whatever I'm doing in any given day to meet deadlines but also suit how my body is on that specific day. So freelance works really, really well for me. And even though ableism in the publishing industry was the reason that I didn't actually go into that job, it all worked out okay. But yeah, my job does change a lot because I'm freelance and it has changed more so in the last few years because my job used to be going out and about, going to universities and schools and organisations and giving talks in person, doing book tours. And I don't do any of that now because I do everything from home. So to give you an overview, this is a list of some things that I've done this year. So I have a couple of long term freelance jobs. I work for Toast, which is a clothing company, but they have a magazine and I write articles for them every month about books. I also work on a long-term basis with the Society of Authors, which is really lovely, and I love doing that. This year, I have run 30 online workshops with individual people. I'll link my writing workshops down below if, you're if you happen to be interested. I finished writing a poetry collection, which is coming out in September with Blood Axe. I have written three anthology pieces for different books. I am currently an editor for a book that's coming out in 2025, so I've been working on that over the course of the year. I ran a masterclass with Arvon, which is an organisation where writers give lectures and classes on various things, so I did that online. I wrote an article for the British Library and also gave a talk virtually for the British Library on Victorian Gothic literature and disfigurement. I have edited four books working with either authors or publishers. I did work for Harper Collins on the release of my book Marceline Defender of the Sea which came out in April. I have written a few short pieces for instance for Libro FM highlighting disability books that I really like and I've done some work for the Poetry Book Society as well. I have filmed videos every Sunday and I have also done a few different events online as well. So that has been my job this year. It is now all online but there are lots of different things that I do and I enjoy that variety. I think I always thought when I was younger that I just wanted to write books and that would be the only thing that I did. But I don't think that that would work for me. I enjoy having all of these different creative outlets. Producing and editing videos is a very different way of uh, creatively expressing myself than writing books is. And I think it is more sustainable for me, um, not just because of my disability, but I just mean long term, it is more sustainable for me to do lots of different things that I am interested in. It keeps me on my toes. It means I keep evolving and learning new things and dipping my toes into different areas of the book industry. And I like that very much. So yeah, that is... Maybe not in a nutshell, because I feel like that was more than a nutshell. That's vaguely what my job is at this moment in time.
Someone said this and it nearly made me cry. Someone said, I've noticed that you seem more relaxed slash confident in your videos these past few years, which is lovely to see. I wondered if you could talk about that. And someone else said, what is something that you've learned about yourself over the past few years? Um, I would agree. I think that I am more um, settled, I think. I mean, I think that just comes with age. As I said, I've been making videos on this channel for 10 years and I think that you do just kind of chill out a bit as you get a little bit older. Also, we all used to be really annoying when we started filming videos. All of us used to, you know, shout instead of talking at a normal volume and we would speak really quickly as well. So I think just losing that probably just makes me seem a bit more confident. But I think in all honesty and as cheesy as it sounds, I think the reason that I probably come across as more confident is because I went to therapy. Um, I had been offered therapy by the rare diseases clinic, which is um, one of the hospitals that I go to. There are several different ones that I go to. And they had said to me, you know, many times, we have this service, we have a therapist who specifically talks to disabled people. Would you like to talk through your childhood and all your surgeries? And the fact that you're like losing your eyesight and in recent years you've lost your hair, so you wear wigs now, is this not something that maybe you would like to talk through with someone? And I was very defensive for a long time, like, you know, no, I am fine and I, I'm more than fine. I deal with this on my own, thank you so much. But then when we started doing IVF, you end up thinking about your childhood more if you're thinking about becoming a parent. And I thought probably would be a good idea to talk through those things and put a few things to rest and just, you know, make my mind a bit clearer. So I agreed to go and see this therapist. And in the first session, when you go see a new therapist, they just ask you to talk about yourself a bit. And at the end I said, so do you think I need to come and see you? And she said, yeah, I would like you to come every week for the next two years, please. And I then had an existential crisis thinking, what did I say in the last 50 minutes? That means that she wants me to come every week for two years. But it, it was, it was one of the best things that I have ever done. And I think going there, and I'm so grateful that I was able to, to have that, going there it just gave me permission to make big, not very tangible things, more tangible and manageable. And I think it's just made me more confident in myself to talk about things when I need to talk about them, to acknowledge traumatic stuff, to um, be honest about access needs as well. And I think also to keep parts of myself back when maybe giving information in a certain situation wouldn't be respected and that would be harmful to me. I don't think I explained that very well. I think everyone can understand this to a certain extent, the want to be understood. But I think disabled people in particular can understand this. We often feel the need to over explain our conditions, especially if they're really complex ones like mine, ridiculous, to over explain them to people in the hope that if everyone has all the knowledge, they'll be nice to you, thinking that ableism only happens because people don't quite understand and that's not why ableism happens. So yes, I have both learnt to not share parts of my life and myself and keep them for me and those closest to me when I feel that's most appropriate. And at the same time, I have learnt to share things when I feel it will be valuable to me. Um, Yes, so I, th I think that's probably why I come across as more confident. I feel like I am more grounded in myself. And um, yes, thanks for noticing. <laughs> a couple of short questions. Someone asked me if I would ever get a cat. Unfortunately, Mr. M is deathly allergic, so no. Do I keep every book that I read? No, every month I put a box of books outside our house and I message our street WhatsApp group to say there are lots of books outside and then people come and they take loads of books and I just always enjoy seeing what books people take. I'm very nosy like that. Someone else said, would you ever write a memoir? Never say never. I don't imagine so, but my new book, someone else said that they enjoyed the extract from my new book that I read in the last video. My new book, which is this one, which is Please Do Not Touch This Exhibit, which is coming out in September. It's a poetry collection. Is probably the closest I imagine I'll get to memoir. This is a collection of poetry about 
hospital experiences about being a disabled person going through IVF. The person who said they enjoyed the extract that I read in the last video asked if I would read another extract. So I'll read a poem called Alopecia, which I think I have read on this channel before when it was published in Cunning Folk magazine, but I, I'm sure that not a huge number of you saw that. So I will read it again here and I will shuffle over here so I can put the poem on the screen if you want to read it at the same time. Alopecia. The first creature that falls from my head is a hedgehog. I stand still in the shower and hold it, then drown it. All pins and needles, no nature photographer. I spill out of the shower and hurl it into the toilet. I flush it, just my animal heart remaining. For some time I think I dreamt it, but then the animals begin to breed. They shed across my pillow, undress on every jumper, scatter naked when the lights dim and their skin becomes balloons. A field mouse, a hamster, a stoat, tiptoe across my throat and lick my scarecrow scalp. Before long, I am a petting zoo. I would say that I mind, but I know that pity is awful, and so I carry treats in my dresses and I learn to whistle a beast song. If I close my eyes and brush my hair, I swear I can hear the animals falling out of me. A nightjar, an owl, a woodpecker, a lark... These days I own more hats than pets, two dozen tiny nests perched above my wardrobe, and me, a magician, a conjurer, peering at a mirror, all wide-eyed in this arc. So yeah, there you go. That's an extract. If you liked that and you would like to pre-order a copy of Please Do Not Touch This Exhibit, that would be amazing and I will love you forever. Pre-orders are super important for writers. I'll leave links in the description box, including options with international delivery as well. I am doing some events for this book in the autumn, nothing in person, everything online. So I'll link my events page in the description box down below. And if you would like to come to any of those, that would be lovely. One of them is with the Portobello Bookshop in Edinburgh. But obviously it is online, so it doesn't really matter where it is, I guess, but it's online. I'm also doing an event with the Durham Book Festival with Kit Fan and Mary Jean Chan, because all of our books are Poetry Book Society recommendations this autumn. So you can attend that either on in person or online. I'll be attending it online. Mary Jean and Kit Fan will be there in person and there are a few other events happening as well so if you would like to come along to one of those that would also be lovely and I would also love you forever for that. I think I have probably talked enough in this video, I don't know how long I have been talking for but I think we'll bring it to a close. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, if you have enjoyed this video and for some reason you haven't subscribed before, it seems like a weird first video to watch. But if that happens to be the case, please do subscribe. And if you enjoy my channel and the content that I put out and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that'd be very kind. Support over there allows me to keep creating free content for everybody on here and also funds my time making it accessible by creating captions and all of that good stuff. I will be back next Sunday for another video and I'm sending lots of love Cool. Bye.